I, I couldn't help myself, but when I read this passage this morning, it said that Joshua was old and well advanced in years. Well, my mind went to, you know you're getting old when? <laughs> and, and one right off the top for me is, you know you're getting old when you go to work day and the next day you wake up very sore. Okay, you know you're getting old. But you know you're getting old when everything that works hurts and what doesn't hurt doesn't work. <laughs> you know you're getting old when your knees buckle and your belt doesn't. <laughs> you know you're getting old when your back goes out more than you do. You know you're getting old when most of your dreams at night are reruns. You know you're getting old when you walk up the stairs and you call it exercise. And probably my favorite, you know you're getting old when you stoop down to tie your shoes and you wonder what else you can do while you're down there. <laughs> now, young people here today are going, I don't get it. Trust me, someday you will. Well. Our passage in Joshua chapter 23 describes Joshua as old and well advanced in years. And what was indeed refreshing for me anyway as I, I read this scripture again was Joshua's example of a man who aged well. And what I mean by that is he shows us how aging can be used for the glory of God. Let me ask you a question. What will it mean to live your final years for the glory of God. What will it mean to live your final years for the glory of God? Because Joshua models for the generations to follow and to us about how to grow old to the glory of God by using whatever strength and eyesight and hearing and mobility and resources we have left to love God and serve others. And Joshua's attitude is that as long as he's still breathing, he's leading the way. He might be up there in years, but he hasn't lost a thing in terms of being a leader. When we come to the last two chapters of this marvelous book of Joshua, chapters 23 and 24, the last two chapters of our study under the theme of be strong and, and courageous. But these last two chapters permit us to hear the closing words of a great leader. This morning, we're looking at Joshua chapter 23, and so I invite you to turn your Bibles to Joshua 23. We'll look at chapter 24 next week as we end our study in this book. But this morning, look with me at Joshua chapter 23. Now, you might recall that last week, we saw Joshua's farewell to the two and a half tribes on the east side of the Jordan. He now gathers the leaders of the nine and a half tribes to bring a final charge. And we find an aging Joshua who is cognizant that his days on earth are nearly over. And so it tells us in Joshua 23, look with me at verse 1. It says, after a long time had passed. Now, not anyone's guess, but likely we're talking about uh, close to 20 years since the conquering of the land. And so he says, after a long time had passed, and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, Joshua, by then old and well advanced in years, summoned all Israel, meaning the nine and a half tribes that are on the west side of the Jordan. And he summoned their elders and their leaders and their judges and their officials, and he said to them, I am old and well advanced in years. Joshua is old and well advanced in years. Now I can even picture him kind of leaning on, a, on his staff as he gives his last will and testament to the leaders and, and representatives of the people. But we see here this morning the heart of Joshua. His concern as he speaks is not for himself, but for the people of God. Well, what concerns him? Well, what seems to be on Joshua's heart is the danger of the people having a major spiritual relapse. It's a warning here against falling away from God. His greatest concern was the spiritual decline of the people that he has led and invested in for several years. And so before he passes, he, he, he wants to, there are things that he wants them to know. And so the main thought from Joshua chapter 23 is this. Vigilance is needed. Vigilance is needed if we're going to enjoy God's blessings. 
Vigilance is needed if we're going to enjoy, enjoy God's blessings. If we're going to make it to the end, vigilance is indispensable. If we're going to make it to the end with a kept faith, a, a finished race to the glory of God, we will have to be vigilant. If we're to grow in standing strong and being courageous each and every day we live this life, we will have to be vigilant. If we have any chance at all of living our final years for the glory of God, we will need to be vigilant at whatever age we're at now. So be vigilant. Well, what do we mean by that? Be wide awake. Be alert. Be watchful, especially to avoid danger. Now, recently... I was uh, traveling home from Massachusetts late at night, and it was, it was about a, a two-hour drive. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a certain tenseness about driving late at night, especially when your eyes are heavy, right? You kind of roll your window down, you stick your head out the window, you have the music blaring, you know, an IV for the caffeine, whatever you do, to kind of stay awake. Well, that's the position I was in. It took everything in me to stay on edge be alert. It's kind of similar to driving in a thick fog or, or a heavy downpour. Your body tenses, and it actually can be very tiring. And you hope you don't have to be in those conditions for too long. See, alertness is necessary, especially to avoid danger. So a certain vigilance, a certain watchfulness is needed to maintain being strong and courageous to the end. And Joshua calls the people of God here to be vigilant. You know, it's one thing for the Israelites to kind of stay on edge and be alert during the battles that they had over the last several years. It's another matter to stay on edge for the long haul. Church, we must, we must stay on edge, alert, be watchful, vigilant for the long haul. We can't let down our guard. That is, if we're going to enjoy the blessings of God and finish for the glory of God. Well, I've outlined um, chapter 23 this way. There's four, four points here. There's a string of victories, and then there's the standard of obedience and the seeds of compromise, and then lastly, a certainty of judgment. Okay, so strings of, string of victories, standard of obedience, seeds of compromise, then certainty of judgment. Well, let's look at the string of victories. I'm going to be picking it up in verse 3. Joshua 23, verse 3, Joshua highlights here God's actions in history. Look at verse 3. Joshua says, You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. See, God gets the credit for their string of victories. It was God who fought for them. It is as the psalmist expressed in Psalm 44, verse 3. It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring them victory. It was your right hand, speaking to God here, your arm and the light of your face, for you loved them. Now, I may not know this morning the exact nature of what you're going through right now, but I do know this. God is fighting for you. He's fighting for you. The Christ who died to win back your soul isn't about to let go of you now. And we mustn't ever forget that while we do our part to be strong and courageous during the battles that we face in life, the God who is for you fights for you. It's God who ultimately gets the credit for the victory. And so Joshua calls them to remember what God had done for them. Well, he continues, verse 4, he says it, remember... Remember how I have allotted as inheritance for your tribes all the land of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the Great Sea, the Mediterranean Sea in the west. The Lord your God himself will drive them out of your way. He will push them out before you. You will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. This is quite a moment for the people of God because as the people looked across the land, it was all theirs. God graciously brought them to this place. He lavishly poured out his blessings upon them. The land promise as far back as Genesis chapter 12 was now a living reality. See, roughly there were five to seven uh, years of battles. 
And at last they gained the control of the land. They entered God's rest. The people finally had their own identity. They had a place they could call home. Israel had it all. They had the promises of God. They had the power of God. They had a, a string of amazing victories over powerful enemies of God. And the people's expectations right now would be enjoyment of all of God's blessings. And wise, seasoned Joshua reminds them of their victories and the God who's behind it all, not so that they can kind of kick back and relax, but to speak of the dangers that often follow victory. Did you hear that? The dangers that often follow victory. I came across this quote. It says, when testings come, we are purified. When prosperity comes, we are vulnerable. We are vulnerable. See, vigilance is needed if they enjoy the blessings of God. Now, in my years of um, coaching basketball, my players heard me say often, score and stop, score and stop. And, and, and the reason I would try to drive that home is because the tendency of players would be when they got a basket on one end, they'd start celebrating their basket, and while the opposing team would just come right up the other side of the court and get a basket of their own. It's just a wash. And their moment of successfully scoring, kind of high-fiving each other, the other team's going all the way around the other end, and they're scoring a basket. So I would say, no, 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 score and stop. Score and stop. Well, are you enjoying a season of blessing right now? Score and stop. Score and stop. Be vigilant. Be watchful. Be alert. Be on the defense a little bit. See, because boredom and complacency sets in right at that moment, and the tendency is to kind of return to business as usual. Don't do it. Don't let down your guard in that way. And that's really where Joshua goes next as he talks about the standard of obedience. Standard, not only string of victories, but standard of obedience. Verse 6. Note this. Be very strong, he says. Be careful to obey all. All, underline that in your Bibles. Obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Now, you might recall these are the same words God spoke to Joshua back in chapter 1, and and now Joshua is passing these words on to the leaders in the whole community. He says, "Be, be very strong. Be careful. Be careful to obey all. And the thought behind be careful isn't anything profound. It just means to exercise great care. Exercise great care. That's what it means. They were instructed... to to stay straight on the path of obedience. They were not to go to the right or the left of compromise or rationalization. You see, if the people of Israel were to keep from the edge of disaster, then it requires strict obedience to God's words. Obey all. Obey all. In verse 8, he says again, hold fast the Lord your God. Now the idea behind hold fast, hold fast is the same word, that describes the husband and wife relationship in Genesis 2.24, and to cleave. So we're to, we're to cleave to God. The call is to press on, not kick back. It's a call to steadfastness rather than drifting into a holding pattern. Down in verse 11, we see it again. Be very careful. Exercise great care to love the Lord your God. Why must we be careful? Why do we need to exercise great care? Because one slight turn to the right, or a slight deviation to the left, listen, it will sow seeds of defection in your life. You better believe that. I mean, what's the big deal, you say, about obedience to all that is written? Because it's when we turn, even ever so slightly from the truth, that we begin our gradual descent from the Lord. You see... We, we, we cannot be selective to obey only what we want to obey and hear only what we want to hear. I like this over here. I'm going to follow that. I don't like this one. I'm not following that. You don't have that option. See, so we can't just be selective here in what we want to obey and, and selective only we want to hear. Reminds me of a story that happened in the recreation room of a retirement center in California. There were four widows there 
who were playing bridge when an elderly man that had never been seen before, he walked into the room. And, and so the first woman chimes, up, chimes in and says, well, hello there. You're new here, aren't you? The man smiled and said, yep, just moved in this morning. Well, the second woman spoke up and said, well, where did you live before moving here? A matter of factly, the man replied, San Quentin. I was just released from there after serving a 30-year sentence. The third woman asked, well, 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 what were you in prison for? The man replied, I murdered my wife. Well, hearing this, the fourth woman perked up with a big smile and said, oh, so that means you're single. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hear what I want to hear. You ever do that? Do you hear what you... Someone tells you something, you go, well, I, didn't, I didn't really hear you say that. I heard you say this. It's because we're selective. Because I really didn't want to do what you said over here. We listen selectively. We block out. Let's be honest. We block out anything that might interfere with our desires or our own agendas. You see, when it comes to the word of God, selective listening and obeying puts us in arms, arms way. It does. Trouble begins when we make God's word optional. It's where spiritual decline gains a foothold. I mean, let's face it. It is rarely the big sudden moves that put our well-being and faith in jeopardy. It is usually those many decisions along the way that make or break us. And so Joshua calls them here to a standard of obedience of all. For he knows one compromise today leads to another compromise tomorrow. And before you know it, you are far off God's path. And that's why Joshua speaks so strongly about separation. Look at verse 7. It says, Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not evoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them. And I read that and I go, why in the world would they even ever consider that? How could they follow after other gods after all that God has done for them? And yet we see this happen all the time. It happens in the community of believers. Do you know anyone who once was going hard after Christ to only cool off and their affections for him because of a choice to marry someone not of the faith? Or, or maybe it's someone who, who's convinced that dating an unbeliever is to, to win that person over to Christ is slowly they start to walk away from the Lord. And as you're thinking maybe about that person, let's bring this biblical separation a little closer to where we all live. Because the standard of obedience that demands separation is really addressing our affections. Our affections. It has very little to do with some participation list we contrive. You know what I mean? As long as we kind of stay away from these kinds of people and stay away from these kinds of organizations and stay away from these kinds of activities, I am protected against conformity to the ways of the world. Not true. You can do all of that and still be drawn right in. See, we must constantly balance the in the world but not of it ethic. See, the problem isn't that our boat is in the water. But when the water is in the boat, <laughs> that's our problem. And Joshua's concern for the people is that they, that they will turn away, he says in verse 12, and, and, and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you and intermarry with them and associate with them. The, the warning is clear. Their affections, their love for God is to be an exclusive thing. You don't have to share that with anyone or anything else. And, and you might look at this, all this bowing down stuff, and you go, you know what? I don't bow down to other gods. There are no statues in my home. There's no, there's no statue on, the, on my front lawn that I touch on the way out for good luck. Idolatry? Not me. Worshiping false god? Not a problem. Well, listen to these words of Gordon Dupree. You might not agree with everything he says here, but he drives the point home, and if we allow that to happen, I think we'll get it. He says this, What is most valuable to me? What do I hold to be most irreplaceable? What would I be lost without? What do I think of with most intensity in the long stretches of my thoughts? What is my incentive for living? What gives my work meaning and purpose? This 
I worship. See, if anyone or anything else is center in my life, that's to have a God before him. You can do all kinds of gymnastics around it if you want. You see, to consider someone or, or something else uh, our most desirable object, that just can be a d- idolatry. I mean, there are legitimate loves and, and legitimate loyalties. Don't, mi- don't misunderstand me here. But they're not to come before God. We must not make anything or el- anything, anyone else central in our lives. That means, that means our kids, our jobs, our ministries, Our possessions, our spouse, our personal mission, our traditions, our ambitions, our fear of man, anything else that you might hold dear in your heart, that's not to come before God. I know this is tough to swallow. Not easy to preach it. God is a jealous God. He is. And he will not allow any other to replace the ultimate love relationship with him. So there's a standard of obedience here. Jesus said, if you love me, you what? Obey my commands. All right, let's go to seeds of compromise. I've already talked about it a little bit. I want to flesh this out a little bit more. Seeds of compromise. Notice what Joshua said is going to happen. The people remove themselves from God's protective care. I want to read verse 12 again. But if you turn away, now that really should have grabbed them. And you ally yourselves, and the word ally um, it's from the same root word as hold fast in verse 8. But if you turn away and you hold fast yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then, and we're going to look at the consequences in a moment, but I want us just to stop there for a moment, and if you know Israel's history at this point and what happened to God's people following this time of Joshua, you'll know what happens to them. The Israelites sold it out. They settled for less than what God wanted for them. They moved away from what God told them to do. Why? They weren't vigilant. It all began with seeds of compromise. They were to drive out the Canaanites completely rather than work with them. For if they worked with them and didn't drive them out completely, they would end up marrying them and turning away from God because to marry those people of the Canaanites was also to accept their gods. They didn't do the job of wiping them all out. You see, incomplete victory is actually defeat. And we start to, you know, I'm just going to do it my way instead of God's way, and and I'm just going to tweak what he says just a little bit here. I mean, it's it's no big deal, Right? It started as a seedling on the slopes of the high Rocky Mountains. And for centuries, this giant tree, this giant tree stood tall against the elements. It had overcome the great and violent storms of life. Lightning strikes did not destroy it, even though it bore the scars of the contest. Winter weather with a 60-foot snowfalls and blizzard conditions did not bring this giant tree down. Avalanches, rock slides could not destroy it, though again, it bore the scars of the battles for existence. Do you know what finally destroyed this giant tree? A horde of tiny beetles that attacked it. A horde of tiny beetles. Little by little, from the inside outward, it was slowly eaten away and decayed, and finally, it fell in a heap of rotten, useless dead wood, good for no purpose at all. And you know, giants of the faith have been brought down by the lack of the attention to the little things that are going on in here. We've got to be honest about that. You might just hear about it on a certain day, but it didn't happen on a certain day. It began with little things over a period of time that they allowed in their hearts and cooled off their affections. For God, whatever that might be, it might be a little thing like that lie to get out of a jam. I don't don't know. It might be that occasional peek at that sketchy sight. It might be that praise that starts to get to our heads. 
Oh, that little thing might begin with a covering of a sin rather than owning it, or maybe skipping that time with the Lord day after day after day. See, slippage may begin with that detour to follow some driving ambition or listening to a friend who encourages you off the path of rights. Slippage may begin with giving in to self-indulged instincts and then the feelings of hypocrisy and shame that are soon to follow. It might be entertaining thoughts of adultery, or flirting with ways to satisfy our greed, or daring to step ever so slightly beyond the boundaries of that which we know to be right. It all, whatever it is, you fill in the blank for yourself, it all puts us at a risk, risk of leaving the God we love. And I love you enough to ask you these hard questions. Trust me again, I ask myself first. Are you on that slippery slope in any way? Are you? Will you be honest about it? Because whenever we compromise what God has said, we will sow seeds of defection and failure in our lives. We may not see it for a while. It may be years before we see it. It is subtle. It is subtle. Compromise is subtle, but it's dangerous. Are you on the slippery slope in any way? Are there seeds of compromise in your life right now? Be vigilant so we don't collapse, don't have a collapse of courage. Well, I need to get the certainty of judgment here. Verse 13, consequences. It says, then you may be sure that your Lord, your God, will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you whips on your backs and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Oh, what tragic results. Frightening words. The people of Israel would experience the hand of God's discipline if they fall into spiritual decline. And although the blessing and cursing theme of the Old Testament has a primary application to to the people of that day, there is an application for us today because the principle remains. When we choose to step out from God's umbrella of protective care, we invite painful consequences. When we choose to step out from God's umbrella of protective care and do our own thing, we invite painful consequences. And Joshua continues, verse 14. He says, now I'm about to go the way of all the earth, which just is a nice way of saying I'm about to die. He continues, verse 14. You know with all your heart and soul, that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. And we read that and we go, good stuff. Oh, Joshua, end with these words. Give a benediction and send the people home. No, verse 15, but just as every prom- good promise the Lord your God has come true, so the Lord will bring on you all the evil he has threatened until he's destroyed you from this good land he's given you. And you kind of go, well, that sounds a little harsh. And I also say, you know, Joshua, as a preacher, you should have ended with a nice poem or some feel-good words. Joshua, we want a happy ending here. We don't don't really like unhappy endings. He continues. He gets worse, verse 16. If you violate the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and you go and serve other gods, and you bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against you, and you'll quickly perish from the good land he's given you. See, the chapter begins with God's rest and ends with God's anger. It ends on a, on a this farewell here on a negative note. But I want us to see the thread here of God's faithfulness that ties verses 14, 15, and 16 together. He says in verse 14, it speaks of God's faithfulness to keep his promises to his people. Not one has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. And we love to sing. And we do so with great enthusiasm. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. All that I've needed, your hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness. But do you know what else his faithfulness suggests? We, we don't like to sing about this too much. God's faithfulness is a two-edged sword because God is faithful both in grace and judgment. I mean, God wants to bless, and he will bless, but he'll also discipline. Follower of Christ, young person, listen to me. God will ruin your fun If your heart has turned away from the Lord, he will. He loves you that much. 
If he were to do less than that, his love would not be a loyal love at all. He would be less than faithful to his promises because he said he'd discipline those he loves. And I see Joshua here appealing to two motives for obedience. He appeals to the grace of God, remember what God has done, and he appeals to the fear of God as a motive for obedience. We don't like to talk about that much, but it's here. It says if Israel turns away and clings not to Yahweh God, but to these remaining nations, then God will no longer enable them to finish the job, and they will not enjoy, as he wants them to, the good land he had given them as they walk outside of the, that umbrella of protective care. See, both the grace of God and the fear of God should move the people of God. Both. What is it that best captures Joshua's sentiment? already said it, be vigilant, be vigilant above all else. Guard your relationship to Jesus Christ. Guard that. Guard it. What are you doing to guard it? What do you have in place to reduce the risk of spiritual decline? Because listen, it can happen to you. It doesn't have to, but it can. It can happen to anyone in this room, including myself. As the hymn writer wrote, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And I used that illustration before, and he did leave the God he loved for a time, and he was miserable until he got back with God, the writer of that hymn. But have you felt yourself slipping? Have you felt yourself slipping? Have you fallen away? Are there any signs of danger showing up in your life? There's this complacency, this compromise. Maybe you're starting to feel the consequences. Or maybe you're here and you say, you know, I'm in a pretty good place presently. I'm, I'm doing all right. Listen, wherever you may be, I call you. Be vigilant. Be vigilant. Be watchful. Be alert. Stay on edge. Be wide awake, especially to avoid danger. Someone this past week asked me if I set my alarm to watch the royal wedding. I didn't. I didn't set my alarm to get up to watch it. Some of you might have. That's fine. Your call. A lot of fuss over that, right? Well, it caused me to remember a story of Charles and Diana, prince and princess of Wales, many years ago. They and, and, and some friends, they took a skiing trip to Switzerland. And, and you might recall it. You might recall the shocking news that came one afternoon of a terrible accident caused by an avalanche in which one of the prince's lifelong friends was killed and another seriously injured. Well, how did it happen? Apparently, the prince's group had chosen to ski out on slopes that were closed to the public. Oh, the avalanche warnings had been posted. Don't go over here, but they had chosen to go beyond the fences because as one of them observed, that's where the optimum fun and excitement were to be found. Most likely, they found a brand of pleasure that was indeed more than attractive but it went beyond the margins of what was wise and prudent. And the avalanche exacted its price among those who went beyond the fences. The result, tragedy and calamity. And like the prince and his friends who could not stay inside the fences, are those who see how far they can sneak away from God and his wisdom and not suffer the consequences. Are you edging out to the fences of God's wisdom to see what's on the other side? Is your curiosity leading you to test the boundaries? Are there any seeds of compromise being planted in your heart right now? Are you ignoring the warning signs of danger? Because his warnings are for our benefit. He wants us to enjoy him and all his blessings why he does it. He loves us that much. Be vigilant. Be vigilant.